Well, welcome, welcome to part three of our teaching series together called Controversial Jesus. We should talk. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name's Ryan. I'm our lead pastor here at Radiant Life. And uh, one of my desires is, is just to teach the word of God, to always point our body to Jesus. And that's my heart. And that's what I want to do here this morning. I, I want to preface today with a little um, disclaimer on the front end. Um, I'm really passionate about the word of God and I'm gonna be, I've been praying for gentleness all week and I think it's gonna come, but I, I'm gonna ask us to do something and then I'm gonna give a, a quick little thing before we jump into the word of God. Number one, uh, can we hold our amens during this message? I know, I know. It's like, of all people, I got Tina in the house. <laughs> that I love my sister over here, that's glory. Hallelujah, right? And it's like the one time I'm asking everyone, can we, there'll be like three times I'm gonna ask you to finally say it, okay? But here's why, here's why. And here's the thing, it sounds so counter to who I am because I tell you all the time to do it. And then you're like, right, now you're telling us not to do it, okay? Here's why. <laughs> it just comes natural to our sister. We're just going to love her. <laughs> here's, wh here's why. Um, today's topic's going to be tough. Uh, today we're going to talk sexuality. And here's what I know. You and I live in very confusing times right now. And um, what I want to do to the topic of sexuality is to bring clarity and compassion. And we don't know if those around us um, could be really deeply struggling with their sexuality, could have a family member, a loved one that they know deeply that struggles with their sexuality. And here's why I say hold back the amen, because the amen to that person could feel very demeaning. That's why. So can we get on the, all the same page together? I'll ask for it in probably three spots. And then you can just let it rip in those three spots, okay? <laughs> I love it. Here's what I know. I wanna say this from the front end. Uh, Katie and I personally have family members uh, and friends that are a part of the LGBTQ community, okay? Please don't look at myself up here saying they're going, it's just a pastor preaching against it. No, listen, I have, we have family members that are in that community. We have family members that wrestle with who they are sexually. So if you're out there and watching online, welcome. And you're with us today. Know that your pastor's in that boat too. I'm trying to understand and my wife of how do you love family members and friends that are in it but show, can, show compassion, but lead them to Jesus at the same time. And it's not always easy. I'm gonna ask us to be unified as a body together. And if you disagree with anything in this message that you don't get up and leave this room, but you and I would have a conversation together. That's what I want this, I want this not to feel preaching. I want it to feel like we're having a little bit of a conversation. I really think, and I said it in week one, I really think that Christians, we need to be very emotionally healthy because unemotionally healthy people get up and storm out of here and say, well, I don't agree with it, I'm done with you. That's exactly what the culture says to us to do. Listen, culture screams, if you disagree with me, you must hate me. That ain't truth. I can disagree with you. I can still love you at the same time. And that's what we're trying to do together. The enemy of our souls wants disunity in this church. You're aware of that. Can we be healthy and have conversations? I know the pastoral staff, if you would disagree with this issue, the pastoral staff would love to have conversations. Let's grab coffee. Let's talk about it like healthy people. Does that sound good? Let's shock the world and say, look at how Christians can disagree, but in love and not hate each other. I think we can do that together. Um, here's the other thing. I, I, I think too that we can hug afterwards. Um, 
I'm not high on physical touch as a love language of mine. Not at all. Some of you are like touchy feely, touch everything, right? You're like that person. Um, here's my group hug to you. And that's it. Okay. No more hugging me. We did it. No. Uh, there's people in the family of God that are trying to, ah, I just need a hug from you. And I'm like, all right, side hug, side hug. Like that's growth for me as your pastor, giving you a side hug. Unless you have Frank come up to you and just embraces you, wraps his legs around you. You're like, what are you doing, man? That personal space right here. You intruded. <laughs> I love it though. I love it. Um, so we'll disagree in love. And if you're here this morning struggling with sexuality, I really pray that you would still feel loved here at Radiant Life. And I want to teach you God's truth and God's word this morning. I do believe this, shallow answers to hard questions is unacceptable today. And I, I, want, to, I want to boldly and unashamedly preach and teach the word of God, even if it causes deep wrestling within. Uh, I do believe God's word will give you abundant life. I do. I have experienced it. I do believe it. And I want you to be there with us through this journey together. Ultimately, you must know this. As a pastor, as a teacher of the word of God, according to scripture, I am held at a higher standard on judgment day than you all. I am. It's very humbling. And what I have to do is one day, when I go, God's gonna hold me accountable for how I taught this. I'm going to teach all of it with grace and truth. And I want you to know, we are not here at Radiant Life, a bunch of good people, trying to tell all the bad people to start being good. We are a bunch of forgiven people, trying to tell all people about the only good person who ever lived, and his name was Jesus. That is who we are. And here's the truth about Jesus before we dive into scripture. Jesus made people uncomfortable because he loved them enough to tell them the truth. I wanna embody that for you this morning. And deep down, we have to look at the word of God when it comes to sexuality because here's the problem. If we're not committed to the authority of the scriptures, we will always be a slave to whatever sounds right. And we live in a confusing time today with sexuality and gender. So if you have your Bible or your tablet or your phone, will you please turn to Corinthians chapter six, verse 18 is where we'll be today. Uh, we'll do, be all over actually chapter six, but as you turn there, uh, I wanna show you a few things. This is a missionary by the name of Paul who is writing to Christians, who's writing to Christians in the city of Corinth. Hence the name Corinthians. It's the letter to the Christians in Corinth, right? Here is a picture of Corinth today in the ancient ruins that was happening then. You see, isn't that beautiful in the background, the mountain there? I mean, Corinth was a massive city, very populous. Um, the issue with Corinth is it loved sin. Uh, the biggest you see the pillars in the background. The biggest God, a pagan God that was there, was known, that was known as the temple of Aphrodite, who's the goddess of love. And some of the ways you worship this God was through sex acts. It was awful. I often like to consider that Corinth was the ancient Las Vegas. That's what Corinth was. Corinth got a nickname because what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. What you did in Corinth was you do whatever you desire. Corinth was known as this nickname, the luxury loving Corinth. And there's a picture, a close up of the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love that they worshiped here. So think with that historical lens, jump in for a moment and understand something. Paul is writing to the Christians in that city. 
Many of them had converted out of the, all that stuff, all that pagan worldly living and became a Christian, a Christ follower. And Paul's writing to them in their culture at that time. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 8. If you're there, say word. 6, 8 begins this way. Flee sexual immorality. That brings a little bit more light to that statement, doesn't it? Knowing the cultural and historical context of Corinth. And he's writing to those Christians that knew that their city was sex-saturated. And he says, flee sexual immorality. And then he goes on, he says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. You'd say, Pastor Ryan, but I thought sin was sin. Sin is sin and sin is bad. But Paul's very clear. With this sin, this consequence is a little different. It sins against your own body. And this word here for sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea, which you and I get the English term pornography from. And this is what it means. It means forbidding all sexual expression outside of God's design of Genesis chapter two, where it was he created man and woman, told them to be fruitful and multiply. This is marriage. Uh, this word is, is stuffed with meaning, pornea is. You and I, in our English words, we have so many words that we can make up. So many words that can, we can unpack as far as what it means to be sexually immoral. The Greek is the original language that it was written in, and the word porinia means a ton of things. It's, it's an all-encompassing word of a bunch of list things that go against God's design in Genesis 2. You can view this word as an overstuffed suitcase because it's just packed with meaning. Like it's overstuffed, it's got clothes coming out of the creases and it's ready to burst open. It's got it's such a rich word. And this is where it's at. He says, listen, that right there, flee from. Don't flirt with, don't stand against it. Run away from it. And here's the society and the cultural moment that you and I are in today is Satan's goal is to make sexual sin look normal and God's design to look strange. That's the moment that we're in today. This is exactly where we are. In other words, whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. Anything that God created and said is, this is good. This is a good thing. Satan will try to deceive you because he's the father of all lies and counterfeit it and make it look pleasing to the eye, but it will destroy you. This is our cultural moment today. It looks at God's design for sexuality, human sexuality and marriage, and says God's design is old, it's archaic, it's crazy weird. Really? You should do what you want to do and anything goes. You know, imagine with me 50 to 60 years ago, for some of us that would have been our parents, for others like our grandparents, they would have never heard words like we hear today. Words such as, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. I'm gay. We have an open marriage. Or don't do research on this one. This is, I'm a dog trapped in a man's body. That's a real thing. There are people spending 20 or 12 to $20,000 to turn themselves into a dog, acting like a dog. I hope your heart breaks. How did we get here? And that's what I wanna look at this morning. How did we get here? And I'm gonna look at two different ideologies of how we got here and what does God's word say? But you have to go back and we, it's all founded in this right here. It's known as the sexual revolution. This was in the 1960s. Anyone not around in the 1960s? My hand is raised, by the way. So like half this room was not around at this time. 1960s was the sexual liberation movement 
that destigmatized and demystified non-marital sex. So it looked at it and said, sex is okay outside of marriage. Like you gotta do what you wanna do. And look what it did, this revolution. It was the reduction of sexual relations to a hygienic recreation in which human beings can construct and create their own sexual value. You can create anything, anything goes for you. And so what I wanna do here is this, was this whole idea of the sexual revolu revolution that crept in said that there are no limits on sex. You do whatever you feel and desire. It should be right. And you let loose whatever attraction is within you. And there are still ideologies from this that exist in our culture today that discipled the world. And it's crept in to our faith. This morning and today, I wanna to look at two core ideologies of the sexual revolution. Two core ideologies, that's it. And um, this message will be shorter than my previous ones, I think. I think. You can say amen on that one. <laughs> You're like, hurry up. Uh, let's go together. Here, here's two. Here's the first ideology. How did we get to where we are? Because the sexual revolution's ideology in the 60s was number one. It was called expressive individualism. You can word it this way. Personal happiness and human flourishing are found in unrestricted sexual preferences or expressions. This came out in that movement. Historians will look at all these different revolutions that have shaped America in particular. I mean, you got the Industrial Revolution that did fantastic things, but one of the biggest knocks on the Industrial Revolution, it took men out of the home. Men now are working all the time and now today we see moms raising families because dad is working, 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 right? It did great things, but it, with, with some things come consequences. And that was a consequence that came out of the Industrial Revolution. The nuclear home began to be destroyed. They would look at this and say, this has the most profound effect on our culture today was the sexual revolution because of expressive individualism. In other words, expressive individualism says this, my identity is found only when I can express outwardly my inward feelings. This is why a lot of people, when you talk about sexual identity and sexual desire and confusion, things like that, they feel attacked. And some of you could be struggling with this because you're like, well, I'm just expressing outwardly what is going on in here. So they feel personally attacked with this. And please hang in there. It's a cultural moment that says, search within myself first. And then I must be allowed in culture to let that out of me to become an authentic person. If you suppress what I'm feeling inside, I can't be true to myself. And there are four slogans that came out of this. Number one, you do you. Number two, follow your truth. Number three, find yourself. And number four, follow your heart. These slogans run rampant in our culture today still. 50, 60, 60 years later, they're still there. It's the idea of trying to be true. But here, please lean in. We turn to scripture to find who we are. And then say, illuminate my heart to find out what's happening inside of me. You are never, ever in scripture told, you go find who you are, ever. And you've got to understand this, friends. You will fill your truth when, with one or the other. Your feelings and desires will filter down into being your truth and you will allow that to be the authority in your life or you will let God be the filter and fill your bucket of truth. Feelings and desires, just because I have this feeling to do something or I have this desire to do something or express something doesn't mean that it's okay or right. Uh, you drive on the highway and you know that you're ready to pass someone 
and you get into the far left lane to pass someone, and lo and behold, who do you find in the left lane? That one person that you're like, dear God, you should be in the right slow lane. What are you doing? And sometimes your feeling or desire is, I'm going to give them the NASCAR bump. <laughs> like, come on, I'm feeling this though. And they still aren't moving over. And you're starting to pray, dear God, would you bless their real wheel and just pull it to the right. Get them over or I'm about ready to run them off the road. But you and I know just because we feel that way. And we may desire that. Does it make it right? No. But it's really curious. It's very curious today in our cultural moment that we do that with our sexuality. Because you're feeling something. And here's the issue. The feeling is coming from your heart. But Jeremiah makes this clear. The heart is what? It's deceitful above all things. And and watch what Jeremiah, it's desperately sick. It's desperately sick. This is why we need a heart surgeon and his name is Jesus. Who can understand it? You don't follow your heart because your heart is deceitful. It will lead you to the wrong places. Author John Bloom wrote a book, Don't Follow Your Heart, God's Ways Are Not Your Ways. And he says this, follow your heart sounds great until you realize your heart has sociopathic tendencies. <laughs> and that's nervous laughter, because you know it's true. Pastor Nate um, wrote a book on this too about the sexual revolution and this is what he says. Oh, sorry. Don't look at that. There we go. He says this, follow your heart has ended more marriages, mutilated more bodies, destroyed more souls and ended more lives than the devil could have imagined. It's hell's most effective slogan. Stop following your heart and follow the one who created it. That's the biblical truth. And know this, your identity is given by God, not discovered by you. You cannot say if you're a Christian this morning and you're wrestling with your sex sexuality, you cannot say, I just need to go find who I am. No, if you're going to do that, get into the word of God to find out who you are. Don't go experience the world. Go here, get into biblical community with brothers and sisters in Christ who can help you out. Because here's the issue. The world says, look inward, but the word says, look upward. And when you look inward, you're looking upon a heart that's deceitful and misguided. You got to look up. There's a famous quote out there by uh, Nietzsche, 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 Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche says this, God is dead. And we, if you're in the family of God, understand, no, he's not. You would, we would understand that. But here's where we wrestle with. Some of us profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but you're asking God to align with your emotions and feelings instead of the opposite. And you're living into that. Instead of every time we take our emotions and our feelings and desire and we say, God, help them align with you. Help them align with you. Because expressive individualism says that it's the sovereignty of self. Did you notice the slogans? Follow your heart, be true to yourself. Be, it's your truth. And the issue with expressive individualism is it elevates self above everything else. And the culture will say, well, that's allowing the authentic person to come out of who they truly are and lean into this one. See, the word is thrown around as authenticity. You and I have that exact same word, but there's different dictionaries for authenticity. When you and I may hear the word authenticity, what we think is they're just being authentic and real and honest. 
but that's not how culture has redefined the word authenticity. Culture has redefined the word authenticity and it's pitted against conformity. What authenticity now is defined is the purpose of one's life is to find one's deepest self and then express it to the world. So now I'm being true to myself by being authentic where other dictionaries would say being real and honest. This one goes against conformity to says just go and be yourself and counter everything your family and friends may say. Counter what older generations have said about sexuality. Encounter what Christian doctrine that's been held for 2,000 years says. You go do you. Be true to yourself. But I would say we surrender every desire and feeling to the throne room of God. The authority in your life, your feelings or desires, or God. What one is it? Now, I want to show you real quick some non-Christian stats. I want to show you what the world and, and those that are against Christianity say about this idea. There's new research being done of how the damage of the sexual revolution has affected us today. So I'm going to show you, again, these are non-Bastion, they're not Bastions of Christianity where they love Christians. They are not. I want to show you something. CNN article on politics says this. American happiness hits record lows. But if the sexual revolution did what it needed to do and you just be you, it should be the highest happiness ever. And CNN, even the political uh, um, Harry Enteen says, well, happiness is at the lowest in America. Uh, look at the divorce rates in America today. The 60s was the sexual revolution. It is almost doubled today than when the sexual revolution hit America. In fact, this next chart shows that on the left side is the percentage of reporting happy in their marriage. The bottom shows how many sexual partners they've had in their life. Notice the frequency. The more sexual partners one has, the lower their marital happiness is. Not only that, the theocratic UK columnists wrote, the sexual revolution has failed Gen X women. The Washington Post, which is not very pro-Christianity, by the way, wrote an article, it says, opinion, consent is not enough. We need a new sexual ethic. Can I say, of course we do. <laughs> It's called God's plan. Remember, these are non-Christians. Wall Street Journal, definitely not pro-Christianity, wrote how the sexual revolution has hurt women. The Atlantic says this, consent was never enough. A generation of Americans have tried a new form of sexual morality and haven't just found it wanting, they found it profoundly harmful. Again, non-Christian articles to realize we wanted sexual freedom and go express who you are and realizing this is not working. This isn't just coming from inside the church. It's coming now from a culture that says we may have missed it and gone too far. This is a post from the unheard. Hadley Freeman wrote, I've written for unheard about the week in which it was finally acknowledged that ex extreme gender ideology doesn't make sense and doesn't work. This is coming from a woman who is not pro-faith, realizing, I wrote an article for all this gender stuff and realizing, never mind. It's not working in our culture. Something has to change. Lastly, this book, sorry, this book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century by Louise Perry, who, by the way, was a huge feminist, like loves feminism. Not so much faith, but loves feminism. And this is a quote from her book. She says this, the task for practically minded feminists 
then is to deter men from CAD mode. Okay, I had to go look up what CAD mode is. I don't know CAD mode. I don't know lingo today. It, apparently, it's got something to do with men having a lot of sex. That's what that has to do. Don't Google search that. Just trust me on that, okay? It says, our current sexual culture does not do that, but it could. We need to deter men from a bunch of sex. She says, our culture's not doing that, but it could. And look where she goes. In order to change the incentive structure, we would need a technology that discouraged short-termism in male sexual behavior. By the way, technology, she means um, general practices. She doesn't mean AI technology. Okay, we need a technology that will discourage short-term male sexual behavior. Also one that protects the economic interests of mothers and creates a stable environment for raising of children. And we already do have such a technology, even if it's old, clunky, and prone to periodic failure, it's called monogamous marriage. Amen. Wow, even she realized, hold on, we already have a system. And I know in her words, it's archaic, it's clunky, it fails at times, but it's actually there. It's monogamous marriage. And I go, God's design, God's design. C.S. Lewis says this. We've had a lot of C.S. Lewis quotes this series. We all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, this will say progress means doing an about turn and walking back to the right road. In that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. Culture says we gotta be progressive and let people experience and express sexuality, but the most progressive thing is saying that doesn't work, we gotta go back. And that's the most progressive thing. First Corinthians says, listen, your body don't you know that your body, it's a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. Do you not realize this? He says, you are not your own body. Please hear this, Christian. You are not your own body, for you were bought at a price, and it took the price of Jesus. He bought your body. So glorify God with your body. It's not yours. It's his he knitted you together in your mother's womb and he has plans, a purpose for you. And we want desire at this church to find God's purpose for your life. Now you could sit back and go, Pastor Ryan, you sound really mean and anti-sex. I don't like this message. Well, I am so pro-sex as a pastor. Just wanna not, let me say that right here, okay? Let me, let me just take you down a road for a minute. This is where you can say amens, by the way, okay? There's a book in God's word called the Song of Solomon. A Jewish boy could not read that book till they were 13. Think about that. That should tell you what's inside that book. It's a spicy book. Let me just show you a snippet of the spiciness of the Song of Solomon. Your stature is like a palm tree. Your breasts are clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruits. <laughs> Husbands, Call your wife a palm tree and see what happens. Just saying. Hey, that's in the Bible. God's word's good. I'm just saying, this is good. Here's the thing. Lean in on this. <laughs> the Bible is pro-sex inside of boundaries that will result in blessing, not pain. That's what it is. God's word is, this is like a fireplace. Now, I'm not setting a mood for you in this moment. <laughs> Just lean into the illustration. The fire is lit, 
and the fireplace does, or the fire inside the fireplace does what it needs to do because it's inside the healthy boundaries of what the fireplace was meant to do. Get the fire outside of the fireplace, it will cause damage in your home. And that's what sex is. God says, I created it, and it's for a man and a woman. Be fruitful, multiply. The bedroom is for that place. And I think Christians ought to have a Pentecostal bedroom, a lot of tongues and a whole lot of laying on hands. All right, back in, back in, back in, back in. Back in. I did have a husband come up after nine o'clock said, I already told my wife, we can get home, we're having a Pentecostal bedroom. I was like, dude, like of all things, that's the thing you took out of the message, is it right there? Hey, lean in, lean in. See, culture says express yourself, but Jesus says deny yourself. Because God wants you to have abundance life, not for, prosper, not for the prosperity gospel, but he wants you as his child to say, follow after me. I know my plans are greater. We're starting to land the plane, don't worry. We're, 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 we're almost seeing the airport to come down now. I did not say we're landing, I just said we see the airport now, okay? Here's number two. Here's the last one. What happens with the sexual revolution that still has its impact today, this ideology is my identity equals my sexuality. We've actually never seen this in history before, by the way, until the 60s. We've never seen this. In other words, it's your sexual desires becomes your core identity. It becomes now who you are. And this is unprecedented. I love what Carl Truman says in his book, um, The Rise and Triumph of Modern Self. And he says this, it's a heady, heady book. But he says this, sexuality today is presented as that which lies at the very heart of what it means to be an authentic person. Remember, what does authentic mean now today? Don't conform, express yourself. And he says that is a profound claim that is arguably unprecedented in history. See, when you look at scripture, in scripture and most of human history until the 60s, sex was something you did. Today it's defined by who you are. And sex has gone from an activity to your identity. And we, it's completely changed. Now, I don't like Sigmund Freud. He did a lot of wrong, 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 wrong things. But a quote still disciples us today still disciples the world and I think Christians wrongly. He says this, man's discovery that sexual love afforded him the strongest experiences of satisfaction and in fact provided him with the prototype of all happiness. Did you catch that? Sexual satisfaction equals all happiness. Do whatever you want as long as you're happy. Must have suggested to him that he should continue to seek the satisfaction of happiness in his life along the path of sexual relations and that he should make genital eroticism the central point of his life. That is what's affecting our culture today. Go be happy, be authentic, but we'd say the heart's deceitful. The heart's deceitful. Brother, sister in Christ, lean in. Timothy says, for a time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing truth and turn aside to myths. You, I will not be a pastor that itches your ear. I'm gonna be a pastor that teaches the word, but please hear me. I love you and we can disagree. Let's have coffee. I don't hate you. This church doesn't hate you. 
we love you. And if you struggle with your sexual identity, you are welcome to Radiant Life Church. And we're just gonna point you to Jesus. We love you. Jesus, your creator, loves you. But you have to realize, sexuality is your authority, fills your truth, or God. What one will you allow you to define? Because culture says the core of your identity is your sexuality. And Jesus says the core of your identity is me. So, worship team, make your way up. We are now beginning our descent. <laughs> we haven't hit the runway yet. We're descending now, now, okay? As I close, as we descend together, biblically, there are four types of love. Biblically. Where are you going? That's my daughter. I'm allowed to do that, okay? So. I want to say so many things right now. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, where was I? Uh, four types. Look at this. There are four types in the Greek. These are, these are Greek words. Get this, get this. Romantic love in the Greek is eros. Okay, then you have friendship love. When you see the word love, sometimes, I mean, it says love. It's just English is translated love, but it means one of those four. And we got to go back to the original language and figure out. Friendship love is philia, which you and I have the city today in America, right? The city of brotherly love is what city? <laughs> Philadelphia. It got its Greek word from that right there, the city of brotherly love. You have family, which is storge love, and you have God's unconditional love, which is agape love. And here's, lean in for this. <laughs> here's what happens we feel because we can't experience love if I can't express my sexuality because the issue is all we've taken is this romantic eros love and covered all the other loves with it and says that's love and please lean in that is a lie you will never actually truly experience the deepest of love until you experience God's unconditional agape love. To the church family, brother, sister in Christ, how dare us withhold any of those love, any of those four loves from anyone who has sexual identity issues. How dare the church. We must express love, and we will love, and we will point to Jesus. This is not for me. Please hear me, I'm not lifting myself up. I befriended an individual back in my uh, pre-ministry days. His name was Ed. Ed was a gay man. Ed knew that I was a Christian and knew that I loved him, yet had deep conviction. Man, we had healthy conversations during our lunch time together. And I would ask him questions and I'd sit back and just hear him and he would have questions for me. Uh, he was raised Catholic, but has left. So he like, he kind of knew some truth, if you will. But he, he left and became a gay man. And uh, I even, my wife and I met his husband, um, befriended him, went to a Michigan football game with him, spent time with him. But the one thing he knew is I still loved him in the midst of disagreement. And that's what I'm calling the church to do. Can we love and still disagree? Can we actually shock the world and say, just because we disagree, we don't hate? I wonder if the world would look at the church and go, that's how to handle healthy conflict. The church does it. Maybe we should model that for the world. But you decide, will your sexuality be all truth? in your authority, or will God be your truth? And I want to close with this. 1 Corinthians 6. Still Paul writing to that church, those Christians, and he says this, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, the verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he's writing to Christians, and then he says this in verse 11, and some of you, you used to be like that, 
That's what you once did. But he's reminding them of their identity. Notice he never said, that's who you are. That's what you did. And then he goes to the identity. He looked at the sin and said, that was the sin. Here's your identity. Are you ready? But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There is your identity. There's a Japanese art form called kintsugi. Kintsugi. It takes broken pottery and makes it beautiful. You and I have broken pottery and what you and I do is we throw it in the trash. But what this Japanese art does is it takes all the broken pottery and finds a beautiful gold and it highlights, puts back together the broken pieces and highlights the brokenness. And now that pottery is more expensive than what it was when it was whole. Aren't you thankful that's what Jesus does for us? That's an amen. No matter what we face, whether you struggle with your sexuality or we struggle with um, uh, an adultery, whether we struggle with gossip, whether we struggle with lying, whatever that sin is, know this, God can restore and he can redeem and he'll put the broken pieces and make it his beautiful story. It's beautiful. What I love about this picture is it highlights the brokenness. The problem in the church is we hide our brokenness. If you were broken and God restored you, listen, that's not just your story. It's his glory and his story. And maybe someone needs to see that brokenness be highlighted because you, Jesus is gonna use you to get them out of their brokenness to become beautiful. The church is full of Kintsugi bowls. And we're finally on the runway now, by the way. Last slide. I want to close with this. It's the message paraphrase of Romans 1, or Romans 12, 1, 2. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Let's embrace it. Don't become so well-adjusted to the culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out, completely transformed by Jesus. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-informed maturity within you. May we, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, be well-informed maturity developed in, in us by the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? Will you please stand?